Charrington, and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast. We're going to be taking a great look today at some techniques to help both new as well as established professionals explore business opportunities that can help them. I, my name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of Photofocus. I am also rocking the 1970s earbuds because apparently my children have taken every single pair of my earbud headphones, so I'll have to put a request in. And joining me as always is our co-host, Skip Cohen. How you doing, Skip? Hey, Rich. I have, I have my sure earbuds in so maybe you, um, you can't blame you can't blame me <laughs> good and uh, we are also joined by our guest Laura too okay I'm not sure what just happened in our sound but we just went through a whole series of alien sounds out of your lips so I think you were telling me to introduce Lori yes please okay I'm on it We've got we've got Lori Nordstrom joining us today, and she's a photographer. She's an artist. She's a writer. Um, she's a presenter, and she's also one of the leaders in our industry on helping photographers build a stronger business. And Lori is part of the SCU faculty, and she wrote an amazing piece when she came on board as in terms of advice to new photographers. And it just seemed like a fun topic today, especially this time of year, because 2014 is winding down and 2015 is around the corner. And there are so many different things that photographers ought to be thinking about to make 2015 um, even better. No matter how good 2014 was, there are opportunities to make it even better next year. And it just seemed like a great idea. So, Lori, welcome to Mind Your Own Business. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And I love this topic. I love planning. Well, it's a good topic. But before we start, I have to show you guys what 17 and a half years of my career at Polaroid now represents because I was in one of the gourmet shops here in Sarasota and somebody is now making a cheese cutter ah. in the shape of a Polaroid camera. So you know, almost 18 years of my life at one of the most amazing photographic companies that is no longer what they once were um, has now been reduced to a say cheese. There it is, say cheese cheese cutter. So I'm sorry, it's a little for, off. For the record, Skip, I, I got a brand new Polaroid camera in the mail today. Actually, yesterday. Well, there are there are Polaroid is back in business, um, <laughs> but Polaroid is more. Um, of a licensing company than what it was when I was there and we had manufacturing plants and 21,000 employees. So yeah, anyway, sure let's... things change a bit. I got the new Polaroid Cube in hand, so I'm actually playing with it tomorrow at a great trampoline park. We're doing a photo shoot of people jumping in the air, so it should be great fun. stuff. So, great right, stuff. Well, and well, it's nice to know if they don't do well 20 years from now, it could be it could be a a cheese cutter. So. Yeah, it's a good fallback strategy because, you know, after all, people will always need food. So. That's right. <laughs> so all right. Spe speaking of innovation and, and, you know, being able to try new things besides cheese cutters, Lori, you know, give folks just a little bit of your background. How did you find yourself in the photography business? What drew you to it? Well, it seems so long ago now, it's hard to even, you know, tell the story, but um, almost 20 years ago now, I was photographing my own kids in my backyard and kind of how everybody starts these days. But back in the film days and back in the very male-dominated days of the photography world, um, I was the girl running around in the backyard hand-holding a Mamiya RB chasing my kids and taking black and white photos. So. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of how I started. I owned a hair salon at the time and started bringing in pictures that I had taken of the kids. And, of course, one thing led to another, and people started asking me to take pictures of their kids. And so it started really back in a, in a time when that was not how people normally started. Uh, that started in a way that most people can relate to today that are starting, for sure. And to that end, you know, it sounds like your business began from referrals and word of mouth. Were you scared as you got this started, or did you cultivate that relationship? You know, did you encourage people to tell their friends, tell other people? You know, not in the beginning. Um, in the very beginning, I was not thinking of it as a business. 
but I also never started cutting hair, or even opening up my own hair salon, thinking that I would do that forever. It started as something fun to do while I went to college. And instead of going to college, I had babies, and I, uh, you know, and, and then you know, cut hair for ten years. And then so after picking up the camera and having people interested in what I was doing. You know, it took it took a few months. It didn't take very long, but as soon as people started noticing, I thought, you know, maybe this can be my my next step, my next business. So I actually went to work for another photographer for a year for free, and learned so much about the business side. And I'm so thankful for that time. And I think that's a big part of what's missing for a lot of photographers these days. You know, back 20 years ago you did do apprenticeships and studied under other photographers and you know I, that's a huge thing that's missing I think these days for photographers. Well actually let's talk about that and Skip I, I know that you have some strong feelings on this as well. I as a business owner regularly have people that work for me for a few years and then they often leave and several of my former employees are business for themselves and they come back and you know they tell me wow I didn't really appreciate this when I worked for you but now this is hard or I learned this and and then I know other people that are just cottage industry I'm gonna make this on my own screw the system let's just you know the only way to do it is by yourself I'm gonna be my own man or my own woman and I always you know for me I, I sort of split it into the best of both worlds I said alright I'm going to freelance and I'm going to work for lots of other people and I kept a journal of everything I liked and everything I disliked and at the same time I was putting myself through business school and I was learning ideas that I thought might be useful and I'm like oh that will never work and you know it was a very much like a four year process for me before I really went into business for myself you know this is my 15th year of being self employed and uh, you know I never thought that that was going to be the case but I love it. Um, you know, Skip, what's your thoughts here and, and why is it important to maybe consider if you're just getting starting out, not necessarily going solo at first? What's the advantage of working with others? Well, we, we all share a mutual friend with Jerry <laughs> Gionis who made a comment at a, at a workshop he was, uh, I was at, um, oh, four or five years ago, maybe longer, um, where Jerry made a comment that he said everything is backwards in photography because you jump out there and you're expected to be an artist but you know nothing about the business. And his comment was that he wished that virtually everybody could go out and be a second shooter for a couple of years so they could get to know the skill set and develop their craftsmanship and then start to pay attention to the business because the way it is now when somebody does decide alright that's it I'm starting my business I've gone to school I've done whatever I want to do I want to be a photographer the problem is that you've got you you're expected to be an artist right out of the blocks but at the same time you've got to understand how to run a business and one of the things that Lori wrote maybe this is a good place to start when Lori wrote this thing about advice to new <coughs> photographers for me her first point was to have a plan and what tends to happen is that people all right I've got I've got the camera I've got the lens but but they don't have backup gear or they haven't figured or out insurance. how to get their name or insurance uh, insurance is a big one in fact for anybody listening that's part time now your home insurance will not cover you if your gear is stolen while you're out on a, shooting a wedding or a commercial job because you're trying to start your business and it's just a common challenge so maybe that's a good place to start is just to talk about the plan. I, Dean Collins said years ago, all you need to be a photographer is a roll of duct tape and a yellow pages ad. So that dates that dates when <laughs> Dean said it right there. But today it's so much more than that. And I've repeatedly written before that any moron can get their first client. The challenge is getting the second, third, fourth, and then getting all those people to tell their friends about your business. So Lori, what what would you suggest when when you say to photographers, "All right, what's your plan? What should well, their think, answer be?" Yeah, I I think planning is so important, and I I have never worked for anyone else. I've had my own business since I was 16 years old, and so when I decided I wanted to be a photographer and I was going to make a business out of it, of course I thought, "Well, I'm a good business person. I've run a hair salon for 10, 12 years. I know what I'm doing." 
And, uh, and I did learn so much through that time. But of course, a photography business is a very different business. And one of the things that I realized very quickly was that I had no idea financially what was going on in my business. I was bringing a lot of money in and I wasn't keeping much of it and didn't figure that out until, you know, I, I kind of hit a wall um, there after, you know, I, I did the same thing everybody does. I worked all on location and for very inexpensively for several years. And then in 2000, actually the end of 1999, um, we moved to Iowa where I live now. What and, part of the mask? Um, I live in a little tiny town called Winterset, Winterset, Iowa. I know where that is. I went to school at Drake, so small world. Ah, yeah, small world. Drake is very <laughs> close. Well, I'm in Winterset, Iowa, a tiny little town, but, um, you know, when I moved here, I, my husband at the time quit his job so that I could start my photography business, start my career, and my, you know, do my dream. And boy, did we think that was a good idea at the time. <laughs> and instead, you know, I had the chip on my shoulder, got to take care of my family, working myself into the ground. I went digital in 2000, which was very early to go digital. And I learned digital crying in front of my computer, literally. <laughs> and, uh, and then he was at home and he was mad, you know, on the other end being resentful. And I mean, it was a mess. And we did end up, end up divorced. And, you know, I don't, I don't blame the business, but this is a rough, rough business if you don't have a plan. And so that was something that I learned the hard way. And I have often said that, you know, I didn't have a choice but to make some decisions and be successful. But, of course, we all have choices. And, um, and I did have to make those choices. I, I got divorced. I was the sole breadwinner of my family. So guess who gets to pay child support? You know, and so I had to continue to, you know, make a decision. I had to decide, am I going to do this and do this right? Am I going to charge appropriately? Am I going to be profitable? Am I going to run this like a business? Or I'm, am I going to quit and go get a real job? And that was something that scared me to death because I'd never worked for anyone else. So that scared me more than, okay, let's get this figured out. And oh. so... Um, you know, I, through mistakes and hard knocks, you know, I realized and figured out that I did need to have a, a plan in place. And that plan is, I always call a business plan a living and breathing document. It's something that should be constantly changing, constantly evolving. And you mentioned earlier, you know, that, that things do, you know, they change. You figure things out and you wrote down in a journal, Rich. You said you wrote down, what did I like? What did I not like? And I think that's important after everything we do when we're starting out. Every first phone call, every sale, every, you know, everything that you're doing, writing down, okay, what went well and what could I do better next time? And then really putting those plans and systems in place so that you can be successful. Very practical advice. We, we have some great questions coming in from the audience and I would encourage you guys feel free to use the Q&A uh, application within the player so you guys can post questions. We'll actually at the end of today's webcast will be drawing for a copy of a one-year subscription of the uh, photographer's plan from Adobe, uh, the Adobe Creative Cloud Photography Plan. So feel free to definitely post questions. We'll be taking a look at that and doing a random drawing from the Q&A that comes in. Uh, we had a great question here from Shireen Dallas that I think a lot of us has faced, and she said, you know, did you have capital before you started your business? And if so, how much would you recommend to start off? Um, this is a tough one, you know. I, I think for these days, you know, I, I just got done uh, buying a physical office. You know, after 15 years in business, we just dropped down 1.9 million dollars to buy our own building and to stop paying rent, which is, I'll just say, scary as freaking hell. Um, <laughs> but what was worse was the process of going to the bank. And it's like, okay, I've got 15 years of being in business, showing a profit having paid my taxes, look at this, here's my revenue, and it was, you know, I felt like I was being treated like a criminal. Oh, you want to borrow this? You need to borrow half of that in order to, to cover? Well, you know, you need to put down your home as a guarantee. You need to move every single bank account you have to our banks. Finally, 
thank God I was able to tap on a family member and just, you know, broker a deal of, you know, I'll pay you the same interest. Great. You know, obviously careful where you do with your business there. But, you know, one of the things I've learned the hard way these days is the days of easy credit are basically gone. And we've just always made smart decisions of, you know, if we used a credit card, everything had to be paid off within three months. If we couldn't pay it off, we didn't buy it. And, you know, we'd save for equipment before we bought it. I think it's, you know, it's better to outgrow some of equipment and better to, you know, build up slowly over time than to just say, all right, I'm going to get $100,000, buy everything I need, hang a shingle, you know, make everything perfect, and then the customers will come. I'm not sure if you had similar experiences or different experiences, but how'd you go about coming up with the money for your own business other than, you know, like, you know, shaking the cushions, which I think I've done at least once. Well, and, and, yeah, and uh, emptying out the, the car and <laughs> working I scrape change. Um, you know, things were a little different for me, of course, because of the time. You know, back in 1999, like you said, it was a little bit easier to get credit. And I, at that time, I worked with the SBA and, and wrote my first business plan because it was a, a requirement, you know, working with the SBA. And got my loan for my building. I, I did purchase a building um, at that time. And I went digital all very quickly. And when I went digital, I called my friend uh, Gary Box, who is a photographer in the industry that many of you may know. But Gary had gone digital just a few months before. And so I called him and I said, okay, what do I, got, what do I need? What do I buy? And he, you know, gave me my list, everything from my camera to my cards to my lenses to my computer, uh, to, you know, all of it. And so at that time, I did, I went into debt. And I don't know if this is the same for most people, but for me, I only needed to be in debt one time in my life, and that was enough. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it will never happen again. And so, you know, to my suggestion now, um, you know, back to myself at the time, would have been, you know, and one of the things that I wrote in the article for Skip was, you know, not to be in such a hurry for a studio space. You know, I, I love now working in people's homes, but I have a gigantic overhead. I'm now in my second retail location, 8,000 square foot, beautiful building. But I love working in people's homes. I love selling in people's homes. And that's such a huge customer service advantage to them. You know, instead of making excuses, you know, I don't have the studio space. You know, use those things to your advantage and use them as a custom, customer service tool. And don't be in such a hurry for all the things that you think you have to have to be legit, you know, in the business. And, um, and it is easier these days, I think, also to you know, to start. The majority of photographers are on location, going into people's homes, lots of young moms with, you know, with good cameras that were purchased for them when their first child was born or, you know, as a Christmas gift. And so it's not, it's not hard to jump into business. You don't have to have a whole lot of things. But I do think to be, you know, to be successful, of course, we need tools. We need backup. We need to be professional in what we do. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a simple person. I don't keep a lot of props. Um, one of the things that I actually say to my clients is I want the things that we incorporate into your images to be special to you. And so if there's something special, I want you to bring that, even if it's a chair. You know, I don't need to keep 20 chairs in my studio. I want things to be special to the client. And I, I started that in the beginning because I didn't want to spend a lot of money on those kinds of things. But in the end, I've used it as a positive to the client. You know, hey, I want this to be all about you. Let's choose personal props for yourself. If you're bringing in your baby, I want you to have your own hat and your own blanket and, you know, those kinds of things. So well, lighting you, you, here, camera. You, you bring up a good point there, though, about positioning things. And, and Skip, I'd love you to, to run with this, too. You know, one of the things that I did as I started my business was we purposely chose to not be – in the fanciest of the locations. We tried to have nice locations. We tried to make it very practical, but we said, oh, you know what? We don't want people to feel like they're paying all this money for a super premium location. It's nice. It's comfortable. It's middle class. Uh, probably that comes from my upbringing, but you know, I never wanted to spend a lot of money on glitz or glamour. And 
as things have changed, as the world's moved on, you know, I think it's easy to feel pressure that you have to buy all this high-end stuff, but most of the clients just look at the finished images and make their judgments that way. I don't think they, you know, our clients don't shop at B&H or Adorama or know the difference between a 5D Mark I and a 5D Mark III. So, you know, are you buying it because you need it or are you buying it because you want it? Good good point. I want the original question was, you know, how much money do you need to get started? And I think the only way to answer that, there's some very specific necessities, and both of you have just hit on it. One, you need backup gear. Um, Murphy's Law is is rampant in the photo industry, and if Murphy's Law is if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And Murphy's <laughs> second law is that Murphy was an optimist. So you really, <laughs> you really have to be covered. If you're going to call yourself a professional, it, especially as a wedding shooter, you cannot be at a wedding and have any of your gear going down, you cannot have a problem with with gear and be sitting there looking stupid. But somebody asked me once, um, or somebody actually it was somebody asked me when when do you know that it's right to go full time? And whoever was standing next to that person, his father had said to him, uh, or no, it was actually to a her. Um, the time to go full time is when you can't afford not to. So if you build up your business as a part-time photographer and you're freelancing and you're second shooting and you're starting to develop a reputation in your community, that point where you need to start to invest money in a full-time business comes when business is strong enough that you're starting to get a revenue stream. Because the real issue to me with a nest egg, and I went out on my own in 2009, not as a photographer, but I left the comfort of a great salary as president of Rangefinder and WPPI and went off to do this thing on my own. And where I needed my nest egg was, all right, what, what's going what's gonna to put food on the table until I've got my business strong enough? And they say it takes four to five years for a business to really um, get to that point where you know you're going to survive and that's probably what it took because I did have to go back and dig into savings. Now let's throw my scenario out and just take a young photographer today that's decided I want to do this full time. My recommendation would be to make a list of the things you have to have. You've got to be insured, you've got to have a computer, you have to have a relationship with with your lab, there's materials that you're going to need, you're going to want to print business cards, you need stationery, you need your camera bodies, your lenses, whatever you're going to be using for lighting, um, your car, you need a vehicle to be able to get around. But to Lori's point, and I actually did a blog post on it this morning, the whole idea, you, people get obsessed with having a studio and it's kind of like new car fever. Once you get new car fever, you know, you're not going to be happy until you go out and get the new car. Well, a studio is that much tougher because once you sign the lease, you've got that burden on your cash flow, you've got that burden on your business that now suddenly makes it necessary, oh my God, you know, I didn't book enough weddings this month. What am I going to do to pay my rent? Or I didn't get enough family portraiture. I didn't, you know, it's about getting involved in the community and building your brand. So my recommendation when somebody says, how much money? Everybody's looking for an answer. I don't know whether it's five grand or ten grand, but you've got to have enough money to be able to get the gear that you need to do a reasonable job. Doesn't mean that you've got to have top shelf on everything. Doesn't mean you have to own everything. You can lease gear, as you can rent or rent, gear, yep. or rent. yeah, as opposed to buying it and killing your cash flow. But you've also got to be able to put at least a box of macaroni and cheese on the table at night. So you can you can eat as you start to develop that business, and everybody's list is going to be different. And I'm sorry, I got off track just a little bit there, but no problem. Well, Lori, I mean, what's you know, we have a good question here about age, and you know, when is it too late to get started? Uh, Elena says that you know she's 26, and is this too late? I'm kind of scared because everyone either seems so young or so experienced. I'll let you in on a secret. At some point, we all feel like the young punk. 
and then we feel middle-aged, and then we start to feel old. And it doesn't matter because I see people at all different experiences. I see people starting their careers at 40. I see people starting careers at 55 and 65. I met some people out on location uh, on a workshop recently, and they had full entire professional careers and retired in their 60s, and now they're doing photography. It started as a hobby, and they got so good at it that they were getting requests for jobs and shooting that it becomes supplemental income, good enough income that they were on you know $3,000 photography workshops for fun to improve what started as a hobby career. Um, I, I think it's not really a matter of age. You know, throughout this, I still encounter professionals that are older than I am, and I'm, I encounter people that are younger. I, I, I hate to say age is a number, but it doesn't matter much in this industry, I don't think. I mean, Laurie, have you encountered any biasness towards your age? Obviously, it sort of affects as you attract different customers. Customers often work with people that they can relate to or seem like them. Well, and I'm on the other end because I am I am now a grandmother and I have another grandbaby on the way. So I'm you know, I'm I'm kinda wanting to slow things down and I own a huge building and so I don't have the option to slow things down right now. I've got overhead to take care of. And that goes back to the last subject we talked about, you know, not not creating that overhead that you have to pay for whether you work or not. Um, is something that happens when you start purchasing buildings and other things that you need to pay for. But as far as age goes, you know, I kind of giggled when you said 26, is that too old? You know, to me, that's, you know, that's my kid's age. I don't, that <laughs> sounds so young to me that it's, uh, you know, absolutely not. I mean, that it's, no, it's not too old. And, and you're right, I, I see people, you know, Every time I'm out doing programs, I'm surprised that the age of the audience seems to be getting older. Um, it does feel like people are, it's, they're choosing photography as a second career or a third or a fourth. They're, they're tired of their day-to-day, -day, their nine-to-five, and they're picking up a camera, and they're deciding they want to become photographers. So the age is getting older. So I think, man, if you're 26 years old, you've got your whole life ahead of you, go for it. I, I think that's a awesome age. <laughs> yeah, this is... I this is to be 26 again. <laughs> um, God, I don't even remember 26, because yeah. <laughs> right, I got you both beat by a few years. But the reality is that any business, not just photography, but any business that you're going to jump into and decide, I want to be a business owner, I want to be an entrepreneur, it's all about passion. It's not, it, it, it isn't about, you know, your, your skill set. Obviously, you've got to have the skill set to build the business, but I remember Michelle Celentano getting up in front of a group of people and saying, and I, and I think I mentioned this on the podcast we did with her, Rich, that she got up in front of a group of people that were all relatively new to the industry of all ages, and she said, wow, 20 years ago, I was sitting right where you guys are wondering how long it was going to be before my work didn't suck. And then she put up a dozen of the worst wedding images I have ever seen anybody <laughs> share that were just horrible. And there's this point where if you have the passion, uh, you've got to continuously practice. You've got to know your gear inside and out. You've got to know every single button and dial and widget that's on your camera body. Um, but if you think about it, digital technology, it's not like digital technology has been around forever. So even a 26 year old coming into the industry today has some interesting advantages to a 40 or 50 year old that's just coming in today because at 26 you've grown up with technology you've grown up with a computer you understand it's like me trying to explain something to my to my 92 year old dad um, who still I can't believe that he's he's on his computer every day but you know he calls me um, every time to see if I got the email that he sent me, kind of missing the point. <laughs> but it's all about the passion for the craft, and there's some definite advantages. But we're also not just talking about people new to the industry today. We've got a lot of veterans out there that are suddenly finding, oh, my God, I don't understand social <laughs> media yet. Um, there are new marketing tools, or there's a new technology out. You know, everything is changing. You wake up in the morning and you hear a crash, and then you realize, oh, it's just another paradigm shift. Because whatever was, whatever was the gospel yesterday, whatever was absolutely never going to change, tomorrow morning is going to change again. 
And that's the cool thing about it. So it does go back to passion. We had a good question actually come in from Kevin that I think will help address this a bit. He's saying, you know, well, you know, when do you know you're ready to second shoot and how do you find willing mentors? Uh, I think it's important to realize that everybody needs mentorship and that mentorship doesn't necessarily mean finding an older person to mentor you. For example, uh, an experienced photographer who's struggling with getting their web identity put together can mentor a younger photographer who's got, you know, 20 more years experience of using the internet on a regular basis than they do. You know, you can learn things from different age groups. You know, my own company has people as young as 22 up to 45 in it and you know, we have a, you know, it's a 23 year history. People are regularly teaching each other's things based on their experiences. I would say that one of the things I think that gets overlooked is the benefit of face-to-face -face meeting. Now, obviously, we're kind of meeting face-to-face -face here with some of us and having conversations, and you could do that through Google Hangouts where it's conversational, but I'm a huge fan of an organization, a, a website called meetup.com, which is all about people who have shared interest getting together for things like photo walks or let's have a coffee group that talks about small business practices and you know it's not just talking to other photographers it's talking to other small business owners there's a lot you can learn you know I've been fortunate that I've had a handful of mentors from family members to just experienced small business owners to other folks through the years and it's just incredibly useful to have those conversations where it's not like okay I'm gonna type this online and then they'll get back to me an hour or a little bit later but to just say you know what let me take you out to lunch and let's talk this through you know do either of you have that experience of you know finding face-to-face -face mentors or strategies people can employ maybe Lori we can start with you well, mentorship for me has definitely been something that I feel is important I for every year up until now even I always, there's, I choose one person each year that I want to do an extensive study with. So it may be going to spend a week with someone for a class or it may be doing an, an online mentorship. And a lot of times these days it's not photographers, it's other business people. And I do think that, you know, business is definitely most photographers' weak spot. It's, it's usually, you know, we're, we are passionate, we love shooting, that's why we start the business, but how do you run a business? And so finding business mentorship sometimes is even more important, and it's definitely been very valuable uh, for me. And it doesn't just have to be another photographer giving you that business. There's lots of exactly. advice, you know. Exactly. Yeah, so, but, uh, you know, a lot can be also learned with reading, and that's another thing that I feel like a lot of people these days, we're all so ADD, and there's so many things going on all around us all the time. You know, we can't edit unless we're, we've got a movie on or, we, you know, we've got, uh, you know, music going or a talk show or, you know, whatever else. And we, we just have to always have this constant stimulation where if you can really just focus and actually read a book, you know, one a month, you can learn so much. You can get an education from reading. And so whether it's a one-on-one -on -one mentorship, local groups, like you said, are fantastic. Um, I know for me, our our Iowa PPA group, uh, Professional Photographers of Iowa, has been fantastic for me. I've built most of my, you know, friendships in the industry through that, and then through going to WPPI and PPA and um, some of the different events. I I now feel like they're family reunions, you know, because uh, of being an education junkie for so many years. So yes, I feel like mentorships are so important and, and get to know the other photographers around you. Skip, sure. yeah, let's, yeah, I mean, first of all, one of the things that neither of you mentioned, right between the three of us, we have an unbelievable amount of material out there in both video form, in written form, in guest post form, photofocus.com. Um, um, what is it, Lori? It's uh, photobiz, phototalk.biz is Lori's Skip Cohen University so there's a ton of information there Lori just mentioned WPPI and Imaging USA it's really important to go to every single convention you can this is about building your network and your network is going to be far more than what it used to be you know 20 years ago we all collected business cards and we had them in a Rolodex that was our network 
today this is about this is about building a network of people that complement your weak suits it's about going to a workshop at WPPI and talking to the people on the left and the right of you and just sharing information Lori mentioned the the Iowa PPA group um, here in Sarasota there are at least two groups here one is primarily serious hobbyists with a few professionals. The other is, a, is, is primarily just professional photographers. They get together once a month. Get into those meetings. Start to build a relationship with people. Look for those opportunities to become a second shooter. Look for those opportunities to mentor. Um, there are some forums. Um, Lori is involved with me in a forum on Facebook called Going Pro. Uh, there are other ones. There's Facebook wedding photographers. There's advanced wedding photographers. All over the place there are opportunities. And then if you don't feel you're getting enough activity out of all of those, then go ahead and go into YouTube and type in the name of virtually any photographer, or any professional photographer that's relatively iconic, meaning they've done one or two workshops somewhere near you and you will probably find some unbelievable videos as well as um, books I know Roberto Valenzuela has a whole series of of two to five minute how-to kinds of videos that show up Sal Sincata has Shutterfest coming up in April it's got a lot of hands-on so there are a lot of opportunities for you to be able to meet people that you might want to mentor with and I think all three of us um, take an occasional email and when somebody has a question um, I know the three of us will do our best to try and give them some help not necessarily directly but maybe we've got a friend or somebody somebody else on another website or another photographer or artist that happens to be an expert in just that area that that person needs some help with I, I do think though with the mentorship thing one of the things I would strongly recommend about you know, finding people. Lori alluded to it by joining local professional groups. That goes a long way. Uh, I, I'm a member of ASMP. You know, I attend occasional net local events as well. I find that tremendously useful. I would strongly recommend that you make sure that when you approach a mentor, you try to make it a two-way street so that, that you offer and say, look, yeah. You know, I can I, you know, if you'd be willing to help me out with some of this stuff, I'm happy to help you as a second shooter or to assist or in your studio. You know, I'll, I'll donate some of my time for some of your knowledge. And that goes a long way. Or pay them. <laughs> yes, that too. That <laughs> works. Yeah. Now, we did, we did have a good question um, about, there was a lot of questions coming in about pricing. If you guys just click through to the YouTube channel for the Photo Focus YouTube channel, we've had some past Mind Your Own Business episodes where we've talked a lot about pricing, so I don't want to go to that today. I do think, though, uh, a good question here, and remember, if you guys post questions, we'll be drawing from the questions for a one-year subscription for Adobe Photography's plan, for the Creative Cloud Photography plan. Uh, but Shaul asked a good question, which is, how do you get past being your own worst critic and build up confidence to call yourself a professional. I can absolutely relate to this because, uh, you know, we'll get the occasional heckler on photofocus of, oh, you know, I can't find your photos. Now, not just talking to me, but like talking to a writer, you know, you're an educator, you're not a photographer. And it's like, well, okay, you know, have I sold my photos? Yes. Have I licensed my things? Yes. Have they appeared in publications for which I was paid for? Yeah. You know, do I, you know, what are my specialties? Well, I have them, you know, but at some point, we all know somebody better. Like, okay, am I a pro photographer? Well, I'm not Joe McNally, and, you know, Joe McNally's been on my podcast a bunch of times, and it's like, I can be in awe of Joe McNally, but am I good enough to hang a shingle, and do I get clients, and do I provide photography services, and is there work that I'm proud of? Yeah, I mean, at some point, you know, there will always be somebody who's, quote, more professional than you, and it's so easy to be your own critic, but for me, some of my strategies, I will post work out there, sometimes just in random places or under accounts that don't have my name on it, just to see how people react to images. And it's interesting. Uh, I was just talking with a friend today, and she reminded me of a great story where uh, the head of the, the symphony in Washington, D.C., went into Union Station, and was, which is the train station here, and played a four-hour set of incredible music, and he only got about $7 worth of tips for playing as a street musician. And this is a guy who, who is, 
you know, first chair in a major symphony. And, you know, he just put on a baseball cap and hid and just said, what happens if people didn't know who I was or I didn't have the prestige of being where I was? You have to realize that every pro at some level is scared that the phone's not going to ring and every pro has self-doubt and everybody goes back and looks at what they did five years ago and is embarrassed by it. So, you know, Laurie, how do you deal with this? And, and Skip, I'm sure you have some ideas too, but at some point you just develop a skin and you're like, well, did I pay taxes as a photographer? Yes, I did. <laughs> well, I, I think for me, you know, I started so long ago and in the film days and there, I, it was a, a little bit of a novelty to be the girl running around in backyards chasing kids, you know, um, that's kind of what everybody does now, but back then it was a little bit of a novelty, um, and as you guys know. So, um, you know, it, the question is a little bit different for me, and I also, by the time I hit 2000, 2001, and I was hitting that crash and burn and getting divorced and having to make decisions, I decided at that time that I was a business person first and a photographer second. And so I don't really care what anybody, you know, as long as I am taking care of my business, taking care of my family and and profitable, I don't care what anybody says. And usually usually where the critique comes in is not with our clients, it's with other photographers. And so, you know, I would say get off get off the line, stop blog stalking and looking at what other people are saying. There's always going to be somebody who you think, man, their work sucks and they have, you know, 500 responses on this picture of how wonderful it is. Why, why aren't people doing that for me? You know, stop, stop doing that. And, you know, Rich, you mentioned that you do that sometimes, that you go under a different name and put your pictures out there to kind of see what the response is. Um, and so I don't want to say, that's wrong, but that would be wrong for me. I feel, I mean, for me, I feel like I need to pay the bills. I need to be profitable at the level that I've decided I need to be profitable. That's what matters for me and not so much what other people think. <laughs> yeah, well, just, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a bit of a unique situation where it's hard for me to get genuine critique unless it's from, you know, people that I've got a long professional relationship. I can get it, but it's just hard. You know, we all... We take a shoot, we've got six images, we're trying to decide which one's the keeper, and you turn to social media to get some input, and all you're left with is more questions or self-doubt. I, I think we did have some other good questions too, which is, you know, outside of wedding and portrait, what are other ways to get referrals? You know, I, I, I think there's lots of stuff. You know, lots of businesses need photographs. You know, I'm primarily in the business of selling to other businesses and producing things that get used for fundraising and organizations. And, you know, I shoot some interiors, I shoot panoramic, I shoot time lapse. And for me, one way that we've always been discovered is by being generous and sharing educational content around that. A lot of times, my clients are people who are interested in photography themselves and they're within an organization but then they bring in an outsider and they found me through my sharing and my blogging and you know at the same time when people go out and they look to hire you you know my tutorials on time lapse photography get a lot more views than my samples of my time lapse photography not saying that they're bad it's just more people are interested in learning than watching other people's work most of the time. And with all the other SEO my site has from all these inbound links, by having an educational section on my website, and Lori, I know you believe in this too, by giving other things to other photographers, uh, my website's easier to find. What are some strategies you've employed, or Skip, what are some things you've employed to uh, attract new business beyond the traditional portrait market? Well, let's just jump right in with the obvious. Uh, own your zip code. It's, I mean, just literally draw, draw a line uh, within a two to five mile radius of your, of your neighborhood, of your home, and literally go knock on the doors of every single business. I don't care what your specialty is. You can be a portrait and wedding photographer. That doesn't mean that the local real estate office isn't going to need some help at some point. Um, it might be new headshots, or maybe it's an interior. And maybe you won't have the experience or the depth in your skill set to do interior lighting and to do some interior shots, but you might have somebody in your network that does, and that's where you start to get that exchange 
where going to a monthly meeting of a group of photographers um, starts to build a reputation where you know what everybody's expertise is. Um, also, get involved in your community. There is nothing stronger than cause-related marketing and being involved in your community. I mean, you're looking for your community to be good to you, so you've got to be good to your community. You got to you've got to be giving back. And Jay Conrad Levinson, who's the who's the considered the father of guerrilla marketing and actually coined that expression years ago in his top 100 list, and I think it's around number 10 or number 12 of things guerrilla marketers need to do is be involved in their community because people like giving back, they like buying products from companies they perceive as giving back to the community. So there are two ways right there as well as get involved with the Chamber of Commerce. Look for those associations in town whether it's Rotary or Exchange Club or Kiwanis or a small business group that's meeting and start to get known so that those those other specialties outside of portrait and wedding um, start to become more accessible to you. Rich, you mentioned ASMP. There's NAMPO, which is the North American Nature Photographers Association. Um, there are, there's really, if, if you Google enough, you will probably find an association for virtually every type of photography and somebody out there that is an expert that can help you find the resources so that you are getting into the right niche um, to help build a stronger business model on those other specialties. Lori, any advice with networking or, or finding clients? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I always say you can't start marketing until you know who you're marketing to. And so I always, I, you know, number one for me is knowing who my target client is. And that's what I would recommend to anyone who is trying to grow their market and is really figure out who am I targeting? Who's my target client? And when we can figure out what she's all about, where she's spending time, where she's spending money, uh, knowing what her priorities are, we can we know things about them that we can market to. And so, Rich, you know, you mentioned um, educational opportunities that can work with in getting getting your clients as well. So, if I want to photograph children, you know, what is my target client excited about? They're excited about things that they can do with their kids, restaurants that are kids fr kid friendly. Um, crafts to do at home with their kids. You know, those are things that I can blog about. It doesn't have to be about the pretty pictures that I'm taking every day. I want to attract those moms. You know, if you're a wedding photographer, um, talk about location, talk about the flowers that are in season, talk about the colors of the year, you know, what's trendy right now in weddings, or, you know, whoever you're trying to attract, talk about those things. And that's one of the best ways that we can get networked with other businesses as well. If I know my target client is spending time, spending money at a certain business or a certain group or organization, whatever it is, you know, going in and offering, and we have the, the greatest tools in our hands to be able to network with other businesses. You know, if I, if I go to Skip and he owns um, whatever business, if I know my target client is there, I can say, hey, Skip, I love what you're doing. I would love to come and take a few photographs of you either with your product or there in your business and write an article about you for my blog. You know, how would you feel about that? Skip's never going to tell me no. There's no business that's going to ever say, oh no, I don't want to be interviewed. I don't want to be talked about. You know, and so we can go and that we've got it right in our hands, those opportunities to be able to go talk about another business and then what are they going to do? They're going to blast it out to their base and put us in front of, of their client as well, which, you know, if we've done our, our work and know where our target client is, you know, we're then reaching out and networking and, you know, to that target client. So um, that's when networking is where it's at, I believe. Um, I've always felt that way, but I think even more these days, 2014, 2015, you know, moving into this era of, I mean, people want personal recommendations. People want someone who says, I've worked with this person, I trust this person, I like this person, I'm, this is what I suggest. So, networking, yes. <laughs> and if you're going to be doing that, folks, and you are targeting something outside of perhaps uh, the portrait business, uh, I find that LinkedIn has been increasingly becoming very yeah. effective to me of connecting to former clients because then you're within a network and it's easier. Even if people just look you up, they may not find you that way, but they might go to verify you and they go, oh, 
Well, they're friends or colleagues with seven other people that I know in my network. Maybe they've done work together, or let me ask somebody. Like, you get these behind-the-back referrals when people are vetting you. Um, we've got time for one more question, and I think it's a real good one. Uh, Era asked about you know, recommendations for doing a yearly self-review. We're in that time of reflection right now. Every year I sit down and try to map out what do I want to change about my business? What am I happy with? And it's tough because, you know, sometimes in the last couple of years I'm happy that we've survived and I haven't had to lay people off, you know. It's, I'm not happy necessarily with the work I'm doing, you know, but I'm happy with a lot of it. And other times, you know, things are going great and it's, you know, wow, do we grow? What do we do? You know, do either of you have any advice on how to perform that end of year review or strategies of, of what to look at? For me, I try to slow it down and write down a list of categories for about a week and then I'll build it up rather than shortchange it. I try to make it about a month of reflection where I'm looking at different pieces and I might sit down with somebody like a business partner or let's sit down with the accountant and review where things are at or let's go through and look at how did my business grow this year? What new clients do we get? I try to not, you know, I try to slow the process down and look for pros and cons in lots of little places. Lori or Skip, any ideas? Well, I me mentioned jump earlier, Okay, let Lori go. Yeah, I, I go mentioned earlier, you know, really reviewing each part of the process, um, especially when you're new. And if you're new, you know, you do need to be reviewing phone calls, consultation calls, sales, you know, all parts of the process. What am I doing well? What can I do better? What, what's wrong and fix the missing broken pieces and so for me it's not necessarily an end of the year review and even now almost 20 years into the business um, every month I'm looking at what was projected for that month and seeing you know did I hit those goals did I exceed those goals what do I need to do better next month and so going into next year into 2015 um, I do like to take about a week of time where I do my planning and projections for the year but uh, projections, I feel, are one of the most important things that we can do for our business. And projections really are, it's just, it's sitting down and, and putting goals in place for the year. How many sessions do I want to do in each category? How much do they need to average? You know, if you're not a portrait photographer, how many jobs do I need to book? What kind of jobs do I want to book? And then, you know, and then you're working backwards and saying, who do I need to network with to make this happen? What type of marketing do I need to do to make this happen? And so putting the projections in place and then, and then every month reviewing those projections so we know what needs to happen to make the next month, you know, either hit the projections or change it, make it higher if, if you need to. Yeah, I like, I, I like the idea a lot of being able to sit back. You've really got to, first of all, you've got to take the time. You've got to make, a, in order to make a plan, you have to have the plan that you're going to put aside a certain amount of time. It's not it's not a one step process. Um, I tend to look at components in my business over over oh my god over weeks. And there are moments when something hits me at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. and she will find me in my office scribbling on the whiteboard, um, which is not a pretty sight. But it's an idea that I had, and I don't want to lose it. And I think it's important to take a look at not so much what you did over the last year, but what is it you want to accomplish for next year. Uh, I did a podcast a long time ago with Angela Carson, who is a terrific children and family photographer out of Detroit. And I remember Angela talking about how much of her business was built on relationships. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but she needed around 150 or 180 sessions a year, um, portrait sessions to be able to do what she needed to do to pay the rent, support her business. She also knew that somewhere between, if I remember right, 65 and 75 percent of her business were repeat business and it all came back to building relationships. And it's the way she would look at her business ongoing because you know, one year ends, it really only ends because the IRS says we're on a fiscal calendar and December 31st it's a clean slate and now it's a new business. But that's where I love Lori's idea of planning and it's something that you're constantly looking at because it really should be more, the way we should look at our business is more of a rolling 12 months. It's not that anything particularly new happens in 2015 on January 1st except for the IRS and your financial side. 
everything else is about constantly adding new things to your business and I think Rich we just talked about it with with Rosh on the on the last uh, mind your own business where we talked about the fact that your website is about what you sell your blog is about what your heart is, what's coming from your heart the two of them work together to build up the next 12 months or what you're going to be doing 90 days from now so I think just think it all ties back into the plan and for me I need to write everything down whether it's on a whiteboard I don't do well typing it into a computer if I've written it out longhand if it's on the board where I can see it I've got this monster whiteboard to my left here in my office and it's constantly things are being erased and added it's kinda like all of us have been at dinners where ideas came up on a cocktail napkin in fact I've got a whole drawer full of cocktail napkin ideas that yeah. came out of conversations with you know you're out with a few friends and photographers so and once again, I go off track a little bit. Well, those are the those are the bonsop ideas, the back of napkin, seat of pants, and those are okay to like usually that. jot down and put into the drawer. You know, I know people who put those into a binder, so it makes sense. We are at the end of today's show. I'm going to announce the winner in just a second. But before we do, if you guys would like some more resources, first off, for anybody who missed today's hangout that you think would benefit from this, the YouTube video will be available just minutes after this live cast ends. So you can share that with your friends or others who are getting started in their business or thinking about making a switch. I hope you guys found today's advice practical. If you head on over to photofocus.com, you'll find a ton of great articles there. I'd also recommend you check out a book that was co-written by Skip and the founder of Photofocus called Going Pro, which would help a lot of you out. So be sure to check over at photofocus.com for a bunch of resources. Skip, give folks a couple of resources, and then we'll ask Lori for the same, and we'll announce today's winner. Yep, you'll find everything I'm working on at skipcohenuniversity.com. You'll also find Skip Cohen. You'll find me on Facebook, and you'll find Skip Cohen at Skip Cohen on Twitter. And Lori, Excellent. where do they find you? Well, phototalk.biz is my uh, group coaching site, my mentoring site. And there's actually on, my, on our Photo Talk Facebook page, there's a little link to the side that will get you a little freebie template download but there's also a link to a video that's got my, my five things that I wish I hadn't done when I started my business, so my five biz biggest mistakes. So I think that's something that's um, applicable to what we talked about today. And uh, so go and download that and watch that. It's short and sweet, but five things that maybe you could avoid that I did wrong. Excellent, excellent. And our winner today of the Adobe Creative Cloud Photography Plan, a one-year subscription, is Ara Rosalani. So Ara, be sure to drop me a line just at rich at photofocus.com, or if you forget that, you can click on the contact form on the Photofocus webpage. Uh, a big thanks to Adobe for giving us that prize, and also would like just to say thank you to the folks at Song Freedom. Song Freedom is a wonderful solution if you're looking to license music for your self-promotion, for marketing, for things you give clients. They have a huge collection of songs available that you can license affordably and use uh, legally in your productions. Cool things priced between $9 and $50 for music you hear on the radio, which is absolutely fantastic. It's a really cool model. And also be sure to check out On One Software. They've got a brand new tool with Perfect Photo Suite that just started shipping. The folks at Drobo, uh, if you're looking for some great storage. So you can find out about more of all those folks over at PhotoFocus, and we also listed them in the uh, support here for the Hangout. So we appreciate them funding the Hangout so we can bring you all this great info for free. Lori, thank you so much for joining us. Anything else you'd like to say as parting advice to folks? Thanks for having me. I, this was fun. Excellent. Well, so glad to have you. Skip, good to see you as well. All right, and wishing both of you guys and all our listeners a wonderful, happy, safe, healthy Thanksgiving. Excellent. We'll be back in about a month with you guys with another new guest. Thanks so much for joining us. And remember, you can catch the repeat of this broadcast over at YouTube, and we'll also run it as a blog post on Skip Cohen University and photofocus.com.